Training camp is upon us. Rookies and veterans are starting to report. And after months of speculation, we can finally start to get more information about who could possibly win your leagues in 2024. I'm joined by Greg Branos of Coach Speak Index, the man behind a platform aimed at passing through the noise to find out which things coaches say that we can actually trust and which things just don't matter. Greg, I imagine at this time of year, you've got to be pretty excited. The rookies, they're going to be through the door. The veterans are coming through the door as well. And there's going to be so much more from the coaches to analyze, but things must be about to get pretty busy for you, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> in a in a very big way i and 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 i love it you know I, I feel like a dog whose owner has been away for five weeks and now but <laughs> but it's like 64 owners right the the coaches and ocs and and uh and they're all coming back home here and uh yeah we're gonna we're gonna get some some great nuggets and i can't wait man it's it's especially when once the season starts too then it's 40 plus hours per week of of press conferences and uh i love it because i'm sick <laughs> that's it if you are here watching this video you definitely belong here if you are sick like me and greg somebody who needs all the information they can get we're going to hit on a bunch of different topics bunch of different camp battles that i think are interesting but if you feel like you need more if you've got questions for greg go to at coach speak index on twitter go to coach speak index.com or the coach speak index on youtube because Greg is churning out way more content than will fit into tonight's show. We are going to start with the LA Rams backfield. My lean here is still heavily towards Kyron Williams. You know, the red zone rushing tendencies for the Rams really changed last year. Before last year, they were a pass-heavy offense when they were in the red zone. And then we saw Kyron have 55, which was the fourth most red zone touches, despite the fact that he missed a bunch of games. He led the league in touches per game at the running back position at 21.5, one of only two running backs to average over 95 scrimmage yards per game. Kyron feels special to me, but am I just falling for the latest late round running back with no draft capital who gets kicked to the curb, Greg? Like, how do you see this playing out based on Blake Corum being in town now? No, you're you're not the only one who thinks he's special. Uh, most importantly, Sean McVay thinks he is extremely special. If you go back to last season and you look at when Kyron came off of IR and they asked Sean McVay after, after I believe it was Kyron Williams' first game back, they asked him about, hey, what's this offense with Kyron and without Kyron? Was, did you feel like there was a difference? And he, he said there was a huge difference, which, you know, if, if you're Daryl Henderson or, or Royce Freeman or any of these guys, you, you don't love to hear that, but he was just gushing over Kyron Williams. Every chance he gets, he's gushing over Kyron Williams. Even when he's asked about Blake Corum, he still brings up Kyron Williams and says really great things about him. And I think the Rams are going to run even more this year. Uh, I believe last year they ran more than they ever have under McVay. And, you know, McVay is always staying a step ahead of the, the rest of the NFL. And you look, look at their offseason moves, they beefed up their offensive line. The, the average weight for an offensive lineman in the NFL is 315 pounds. The average weight for the Rams offensive lineman is 330 pounds. They're going to run the ball like crazy this year, and, and Kyron's going to be a big part of that. And people that, who think that Blake Corman is going to come in and, 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 and make this a 50-50 split have not been listening to what the coaches and, and the GM have said. Les Snead said the Blake Corman pick was about lessening the load for Kyron so we don't just wear him down completely so I think this is, is this will be a, a 70 30 or 75 25 split between the two and how reliable do you rank Sean McVay and Les Snead out of NFL GMs and coaches when it comes to being able to take their word at this sort of stuff with depth chart he's 90 percent with usage and workload coach speak uh he is uh 80 percent which is pretty good he, you know, he'll have a big curveball every once in a while. We saw this with Cam Akers last <laughs> season, which was kind of a lesson that that I learned. Um, McVay was talking, I think it was in May of 2023, might have been March, about Cam Akers. And what he was saying was an exact language match to what he had said about Todd Gurley in a previous season. Oh, really? Like <laughs> word for word. It was crazy. And... um but, but the big thing there was it, was, it was the mental stuff. It was the attitude stuff. McVeigh has this really high standard 
for his players and he wants them to you know follow follow where the entire team is going right not an individual thing not like hey i need more touches i need these goal line touches uh and that's kind of what happened with cam Akers last year is that he he got back up to a place where sean mcveigh trusted him but then after mcveigh made those comments that started to uh to deteriorate and then we saw kyron williams take over love it so let's move on but before we get to our next player if you're finding our stuff for the first time, hit that subscribe button down below. We're closing in on 2,500 subscribers. We've got loads of redraft content coming to you, at least two best ball streams a week, and Rich's dynasty content is all year round. The Cardinals backfield. James Conner averaged 18 PPR points per game when playing with Kyler Murray last year compared to 12 of out. Yes, he misses, what, four, five, six games per year, but it's a position where most running backs do. There's a 22 spot gap between James Connor and Trey Benson on underdog. Connor's at 88, Benson's at 110. Benson was one of those prospects that we would have liked him to land in a different place. I know the dynasty community is still hyped about him for maybe a year down the line. But do you think that this is just a clear case where James Connor, unless he gets injured early, is going to be the running back that we want for this backfield? Yeah, I I, I absolutely believe James Connor is the clear. RB1 for for Arizona head coach Jonathan Gannon loves him and he talked last year about the age cliff where James Conner turns I believe 29 this year and Gannon said you know if 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 anyone were to overcome that age cliff it would be James Conner just because of the the work ethic and the kind of guy that he is they 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 love him man they they ran the ball really well with him last season they said last year that they wanted him to be a workhorse. Maybe we'll get that same language during during training camp. Really, we just need to be right or to ask him, hey, do you still feel the same way about him this year? What's what's his workload uh, going to look like? And, you know, Tra- Trey Benson never dominated snaps when he was in college. Like, we really think he's going to come in and supplant James Conner here? That's, that's not going to happen. So I, I see him more as a as a change of pace back. They do like his, um, the fact that he can hit these home runs in the receiving game. Uh, so, so yeah, I, th- I think we'll see that, but mainly it's, it's going to be the James Conner show. Yeah. And th- that's how I've been playing it. Like, I think, you know, if you need to take Trey Benson for structural reasons in fantasy football, then that absolutely makes sense. If you're in best ball and you missed out on James Conner and you're in that, area where the running backs start to dry up and there's a big tier of difference between where Trey Benson is, but then you get down to the likes of, you know, you get to Jalen Wright and that area where it's like, there's definitely more obstacles for Jalen Wright to overcome possibly to be fantasy viable in year one. James Conner is just a straight up dog. And when you look back at his career, I kind of have a little more faith in the guys who hit 29 years old to still be to keep going if they're a little bit slower in how they started out in the career, like James Conner wasn't somebody who came into the NFL and straight away was seeing two, well, three, 400 touches in a season. And you can compare that to Derrick Henry, who's a bit of a special case, but it took time. He was splitting work with Deion Lewis when he first came in. So yeah, I've got plenty of faith in James Conner. I think that this is a backfield that if you're drafting Trey Benson aggressively, you just, you know, you're expecting James Conner to get injured. And even if James Conner gets injured, he could get injured in the middle of the season and he could be back again by the time fantasy playoffs are around. So in redraft, I'd rather leave Trey Benson on waivers and let somebody else have the headache with him until something happens. Another backfield, the Pittsburgh Steelers. Now, this one could be a nightmare. Not many of us are willingly signing up for more Arthur Smith in our life after the way that he dealt with Bijan Robinson and the way that he dealt with Drake London over the last couple of years. But this one could actually be really good for fantasy football because Russell Wilson and Justin Fields were the two quarterbacks who led the league in check down rate when kept clean last year. So if they're going to be turning these running backs into PPR scams, then I'm down with it. My lean is towards Jalen Warren. He had the second highest rate of explosive plays among running backs last year. But Najee is the bigger bodied running back that Arthur Smith has liked around the goal line throughout his career. 
Last year, it broke 48% of snaps for Jalen Warren, 52% to Najee Harris. Warren was the RB28 in PPR points per game. Najee was the RB35. What have you heard from the Steelers to give you an indication of how this backfield's going to shake out? A, a lot of different things that I think work well in concert with each other. Um, you know, going back to last year, they asked Mike Tomlin about, about Jalen Warren. He said, yeah, he's, he's playing really well. He's going to start to get more touches now. And we saw that happen. And then, you know, Arthur Smith comes in and they ask him about the backfield. And he says, well, you've got 11, about 1,100 offensive plays during the NFL regular season. And he does the math, like, immediately he says, so 550 of those, you know, Derrick Henry, I didn't give him 550 touches. So it's basically saying that they're going to run the ball 50% of the time and that he's basically going to kind of split up that work. He did also say uh, in non-traditional ways as well, which is like, oh no, Cordero Patterson. It's coming. <laughs> yeah. Uh, here's here's Pruitt on his third sweep in a row. Um, but yeah, so it's it's like you said, Arthur Smith loves like big thumping running backs. So I do think Najee Harris is gonna see the majority of of, of goal line work there, but Jalen Warren is just so explosive and efficient that if if he gets anywhere near to a 50% share here in this backfield, like they could both pay off their their ADP. We we think about, oh man, this, this backfield is going to be a nightmare trying to figure out. I don't think the Steelers' backfield is a nightmare. I, I think the Broncos running back uh, pitcher might be a nightmare because you, you've got like five different guys there. But this is pretty clear. It's, yeah, it's Najee Harris, it's Jalen Warren. And even if, if, like if they're not a workhorse running back, that's fine because they're running the ball at a higher rate than other offenses are, right? So they could still see the same amount of touches as um, like a Jonathan Brooks or like maybe a Zamir White, right? Even though those backs will get a higher share when they're playing, but they're, you know, those teams might not run the ball as much or, or be as in, uh, efficient on offense no i love that and it's it's the perfect point because you know we've got Najee harris going at 83 on underdog at the minute we've got jalen warren going at 89 and when we get to redraft drafts i think that there'll be a lot of people who aren't sickos who are coming into things and going well Najee harris is the clear running back one and he'll get pushed up a bit more in those scenarios but unless Najee really gets pushed up significantly I think it's exactly like you say. Maybe we don't get David Montgomery and Jameer Gibbs like last year, but if we can get two running backs who come close to paying off their ADP performers, top 20 to 30 running backs, then I'm fine with that, particularly in best ball if you get in spike weeks from both of them. How much do you think you can translate Arthur Smith's head coaching comments to now as an offensive coordinator, do you think that it tracks being able to trust what he said then or whether you weren't able to trust it, maybe the case, <laughs> to now that he's an offensive coordinator? Do you think there's anything in that? Well, Arthur Smith had one of the most unreliable coach speak profiles, if you can believe that, if you can believe it. Shocking. <laughs> <laughs> but um, so, so, something very important to to keep in mind is Recently, uh, Mike Tomlin was asked about, you know, the, the assistant coaches and, and their input and, and all that. And he said, um, basically, he said, assistants make suggestions, head coaches make decisions. So there, there's not going to be any of this bullshit around the goal line where, you know, he's doing he's doing darnell washington double reverse sweeps you know uh that's yeah. that's not gonna happen that's that's not gonna fly with with mike tomlin so i i think you gotta you gotta um, think like what is the vision that mike tomlin has and that arthur smith has that will you know kind of come together here and we know that both of them like Najee harris we know that both of them like jalen warren and and they want to run the ball they invested in in the offensive line so, yeah, I don't expect the types of shenanigans 
in Pittsburgh that we saw in Atlanta. It would make all of our lives in the fantasy community a lot easier and probably even Steelers fans' lives slightly less frustrating. Stay in the AFC North, but go across to the Cincinnati where the Bengals backfield. Zach Moss came in just shy of 1,000 all-purpose yards last year, started incredibly hot whilst Jonathan Taylor was out, and then kind of faded, wasn't really able to recreate it further down the line. But the Chase Brown experience, it boiled down a, a couple of real highlight, real plays, 33 rush attempts, 13 targets. He did lead all rookie running backs in yards per target. He did a video with Hayden Winks last night, which has just gone out on our YouTube channel, where Rich pointed out that Chase Brown was awful in pass protection. So really, what I'm kind of wondering with this backfield is, have we ever heard much from the new offensive coordinator, Dan Pitcher, who's been around the team for a while? Or have you heard anything from the Bengals to suggest that they really do want to add a third running back to this mix and make it more of a nightmare? Because at the minute, it feels like we can take shots on either one and they'll probably have value. The Bengals have not had many press conferences during the offseason. We've like rarely, rarely heard from from Dan Pitcher yet. Um, Zach Taylor did say a couple things on on Zach Moss and, and Chase Brown. On Zach Moss, he was just saying, like we know what Zach Moss is and and what we want him to be, and 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 we see him being that here. Now he didn't expound on exactly what what that is. Um, and then with Chase Brown, just saying that. They asked him to work on his on his pass catching in on third downs because the more you make yourself available to be on the field, the more playing time that you can get. And and saying that he did, that he, he's been doing a, a good job of that. The pass protection thing is pretty weird because he did grade out as, as a good back in pass protection in college. But then, yeah, last year, pretty, pretty bad. He's not a small guy, so it's not a... You know, Jaleel McLaughlin, Bucky Irving type thing where they're 190 pounds and these guys come <laughs> and flying out them outweigh by like 80 pounds or whatever. He Chase Brown is, I think, right around like 215 ish. Um, so it's not it's not like a a, a matter of, of of mass and weight. It's seems to be technique, right? Which that that you can kind of work on if if you're small like you're just small you can't do much about that right you can have the techniques and still get bowled over so maybe chase brown does improve on that we'll we'll see in training camp maybe maybe we'll get some reports there have been reports of hey maybe they might bring some aj p ryan in if if the broncos end up cutting him they're very familiar with p ryan and he would actually work pretty nicely here in cincinnati yeah, definitely. I think like as long as it stays as a two-headed backfield, it's going to be fine. I think it'll be fantasy viable. I mean, you, your point on Chase Brown about how he was a good pass protector in college, that was something Roshan Johnson excelled at, and then last year he didn't do particularly well. Maybe it's just that kind of thing. You get into the NFL and the pass rush is that much more daunting, but there's definitely a good chance for in a second year where you're getting more snaps where the team want to build you, you know, last year, Joe Mixon was the plan in Cincinnati last year. There was other backs ahead of Roshan Johnson in Chicago. So now if the team understands what you are and understands that that's the one weakness that they need to keep you off the field for, perhaps teams can build around it. Moving over to wide receivers, the Kansas city chiefs wide receiver room. This is one which I struggle with in best ball drafts. I feel like, you know, I just take Patrick Mahomes. And I stack him up with whichever wide receivers fall to me at value or feel like the right one for a build. But in redraft, I'm really struggling to decide how I want to place. You've got the veteran who hasn't been healthy or quite delivered in Hollywood Brown. You've got the mercurial rookie, the fastest player to possibly ever enter the NFL in terms of since we definitely since we started doing the 40 yard dash. And then you've got the guy who this offseason has given us a few nightmares in terms of character concerns in Rashi Rice. So I know you put out some quotes today about Andy Reid saying Worthy's a full go after hamstring issues. And I know that we're kind of waiting to find out about Rashi Rice suspension. Do you have any strong convictions on what's the best way to play this? Oh, man. 
I, I've been obsessing over this for, it feels like months now. Uh, so pa Patrick Mahomes, first of all, Andy Reid yesterday said that Xavier Worthy, full go, they're going to ease him back in. Patrick Mahomes said they're, they're not easing him back in like <laughs> they're ready to go man and Mahomes also uh about a month or two ago they asked him about the offense this year right how how last year very low average depth of target and didn't see as many deep shots and it seems like that might change this year it, they really focused on that during OTAs and now they actually have the personnel to do that Right. They brought in Hollywood Brown. They drafted Xavier Worthy. So this thing of where we are, we're drafting or we're thinking about teams the same way that we viewed them last year. Like we should not view the Kansas City Chiefs offense the same way that 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 like the impression that they gave us at the end of the season. Right. Uh, the end of the fantasy season. Like this is going to be very different. They have different personnel now. So what what do we think that's going to look like? Well, Patrick Mahomes and Andy Reid, they're talking about the deep ball more. They're, they're talking about how they want to attack deep now, um, which, I mean, that that's another thing that gives me a little bit of pause of Rasheed Rice, right? I mean, we do know how great he is with the ball in his hands. We know we know how, you know, he's incredible yak and, and all the metrics so good like a very good player obviously you want to get him the ball but he's not the only guy there now right last year it was him and travis kelsey and they're just kind of working off of each other uh in in, in the intermediate area of the field and patrick mahomes ends with the lowest a dot of his career what what is that target share going to be this year for rishi rice even if he doesn't miss any time right like whenever he's on the field what is that going to look like? It's it's not going to look like it did last year. Now, maybe it gets even better because teams have to worry about Hollywood and Xavier Worthy, right? And Travis Kelsey. So, like, now the middle's really opened up for him. So, yeah, this is, like, all I think about is is this Chiefs offense. But I, I like what you said about, yeah, taking Patrick Mahomes because he's the first one off the board there, you know, going before his receivers, which isn't always the case with uh with teams and, and and players but yeah taking him and then seeing yeah what what kind of value can i get because they all go fairly quickly right within two rounds yeah. of, of each other so you basically have three shots to to get one of those guys if if you haven't already grabbed kelsey before before taking Mahomes. yeah so you mentioned how the chiefs want to get the deep game going more how reliable do you find Andy Reid as a head coach? Like when he says that this is something that he wants to do, is that something that typically shines through? He is not super reliable with his coach speak. <laughs> but when, when like the quarterback is talking about it as well, and then other players are talking about it, and beat writers are talking about how much they're throwing deep during OTAs, then it's like, okay, like, it's 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 not just one plume of smoke here, right? It's it's a lot of pillars of smoke going up. So so maybe we have a nice fire that's that, that's burning over here. Yeah, I my lean is that I'll keep taking the Rashi Rice discount. I mean, as you said, if the middle of a field opens up, we saw what he did last year. And yes, I'm not necessarily expecting 17 PPR points per game like he hit there. Hollywood, I don't mind mixing in for best ball. You know, he's had four straight years with 100 plus targets, but he's never been a top 20 wide receiver in PPR points per game. And Xavier Worthy, I mean, Xavier Worthy's just fun. Like, I can't imagine playing fantasy football and not wanting fun players on my roster. So I don't want to go too heavy on Hollywood or Xavier Worthy. Like, in best ball, if you're drafting 100 plus teams, I think. Sticking at 10 to 15 percent on those guys is where you want to be. Rashi Rice, I'm definitely a bit higher simply because the discount is going to come to an end pretty soon when we know what he's facing suspension wise, or if we find out he's not going to be suspended. Have they said much about the suspension in general that kind of gives you any clues to when we might find anything out? 
No, a- Andy Reid yesterday said that he hasn't heard anything about it, so he doesn't know. I'm not sure whether that's true, right? That he's heard nothing yeah. at all about it, that he has no inkling that <laughs> that he knows as much as, as we do. Uh, but uh, but we'll see. But, I, I mean, doesn't this seem like this is setting up for a, for a Patrick Mahomes MVP season? Oh, yeah. I mean, it's that classic kind of thing of where Patrick Mahomes had a stinker in comparison to what we expect from Patrick Mahomes. But we've seen Patrick Mahomes' floor now. I think that you look at the year before the last one, and he had like 12 games where he hit 300 passing yards in out of the regular fantasy seasons. So I can't imagine not wanting a decent amount of Patrick Mahomes, particularly in redraft. I don't think you can find a more reliable quarterback for redraft this year. Yes, Josh Allen, you can poke holes and go, okay, well, he's probably not going to rush 15 touchdowns again this year. He's only got a depleted wide receiver room. Jalen Hurts, possibly, but it could just be possible that Kellen Moore isn't a great offensive coordinator. It could be possible that Nick Sirianni isn't a great head coach. Lamar Jackson, we know, can be up and down with his fantasy production, particularly if Derrick Henry rushes for like 400 touchdowns. Patrick Mahomes with possibly the best wide receiver core he's had in terms of overall like ability from the top three. I'm not saying that any of them better than Tyree Kill, but yeah, like when you add that, you add in Travis Kelsey and then Pacheco, who just keeps coming on. It's very hard for me to poke holes in anything to do with Patrick Mahomes. So yeah, absolutely. Mahomes MVP definitely feels good to me. If you haven't already, do hit that subscribe button. Loads of good redraft content coming your way. Got long form videos, short form videos, podcasts. We've got it all here. Buffalo wide receivers. We touched on Josh Allen before, but Chase Claypool is generating chatter, which is a whole subject on its own. Keon Coleman is generating chatter, but not in a particularly good way, continuously referred to as someone to develop. Curtis Samuel, though, was somebody that they seem to prioritize within free agency. He brings more burst to a team that ranked 29th in speed within the first two yards of the line of scrimmage in 2023. Khalil Shakir, we kind of saw him break out when Stefan Diggs was doing nothing last year. How do you imagine that this wide receiver room is going to play out? I think it's going to be Curtis Samuel and Khalil Shakir. And then obviously, you know, Dalton Kincaid getting getting his fair share of targets. But yeah, I think it's going to be those two. Their offensive coordinator, Joe Brady, talking about Curtis Samuel. Man, just this guy just lining up when they asked him about Curtis Samuel. He said, I, I wish we had all Curtis Samuels, right? <laughs> just an entire team of Curtis Samuels. Um, so that that's pretty good. And then also talking about Khalil Shakir and the, the big leap that he made last year and how he really likes him. The Chase Claypool stuff, you know, uh, I mean, we've, we've seen him, right? Like this isn't a, this isn't a rookie coming in who we we know Chase Claypool doesn't like to block, doesn't like to put in the work and effort. And like, how is he going to stay on the field if that's the case? Right. This guy's been bouncing around everywhere. We think he's going to stay here. So if you took Josh Allen on a roster and you were looking for, Late round best ball dart throw. Would you rather go with MVS or Chase Claypool? I, I would go MVS over Chase Claypool, and I'd probably go Mac Hollins over Chase Claypool. Yeah. Um, in terms of Khalil Shakir, how much of a jump do you think he can make? He's a guy who's kind of going around that what round 10 level in best ball. I wouldn't be surprised if in redraft ADP he drops a little bit further as people just feel like they possibly haven't seen quite enough from him. Do you think that the coaching staff really want to make him into a top wide receiver or at least, you know, a wide receiver two behind the wide receiver one, Curtis Samuel? I mean, I I think they would be fine with him just playing at the same kind of level that he was playing at last year. You know, we don't don't always need a, a guy to make another big jump. I mean, it would be nice, right? But they don't always do that. And... I mean, he played pretty well 
last year over, over the last half of the season, Buffalo is going to run the ball more under Joe Brady than they were under Ken Dorsey. So that's another thing to take into consideration. I'm not like going crazy over buying Khalil Shakir, but certainly when I see some value there in, in best ball drafts, I'm, I'm, I'm very in on that. So does that feeling that they're going to run the ball a lot more under Joe Brady, does that leave you to be really high on James Cook? Or are you looking at like Ray Davis as late round dart throw that potentially could have value in both redraft and best ball? I'm, I'm really split on James Cook because they don't trust him near the goal line. Yep. And that's so important in fantasy <laughs> football. Touchdowns help, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And he's not he's not a great receiving back either. Like we, we see them use him in the passing game, but a lot of drops. And they did not like that. And uh they they do like Ray Davis. I'm not sure how productive he's gonna be. Like not not the best profile. He's almost my age i think <laughs> um but big bigger back here who who will probably get some some goal line work would like him a lot more if they didn't have a rushing quarterback in in Josh Allen but yeah the the James Cook is very exciting with the ball in his hands but you got to get the ball in his hands and that's usually happening out, outside of the 10 yard line so he's going to have to break off some big runs. I think he has like five rushing touchdowns in his two seasons, and only only one of them was less than, I believe, 24 yards. <laughs> so just looping this back to the wide receivers quickly, and Keon Coleman, who the Bills obviously placed decent draft capital in, they did trade back, maybe, maybe it was even twice. I know they traded back at least once during the draft before taking Coleman. Do you think, because the comments about him were pretty scathing, do you think those are things that we should be worried about? Yeah, we, we should definitely be worried about them at his ADP, especially where where he's been going. He He's dropping now, but the price was, I thought, egregious a few weeks ago, going going in the 70s. Now he's dropping around the the 80s. But yeah, they're talking about him as a, developmental guy and they're talking about him initially of him playing the X which if you follow Matt Harmon's work this is not the best place to pl to to play Keon Coleman and I mean he, good contested catch receiver right but not a great route runner so are we just relying on on Josh Allen throwing bombs to him and and, and him catching every single one I mean, maybe, maybe it happens, right? We, we we saw that a little bit. I mean, I, just completely different players and, and prospects, but we saw a lot of that big play stuff in Jamar Chase's rookie season, right? Where, yeah, he, he'd, he still would have had a really good season, but some things kind of broke his way on, on those big plays, and, and some of them were, were broken. So, I mean, maybe they established some, some kind of, rapport josh allen is just so good at improvising and keon coleman is a big dude who, yeah. who can run down the field so maybe maybe that ends up working out and he hits as, as a big play merchant but that's that's what he's gonna have to do right there's so, there, there's no like he gets 10 targets and 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 breaks off a bunch of yak it's it's gonna have to be the deep ball stuff so i i know you're in the best ball streets and i know you grinding out plenty of drafts keon coleman currently going to 80 on underdog curtis samuel at 91 do you think those should be flipped the other way i i i think curtis samuel should be going ahead of keon coleman i don't think necessarily curtis samuel should be going at 81 i yeah. i think he's so I'd we like we keep Curtis Samuel 91. where he is, but maybe drop Keon Coleman down to like the 105 range where you got Romeo Dubs, Khalil Shakir, Rashid Shahid, Josh Palmer, like that sort of tier of wide receiver maybe would fit 
where I'd be willing to take Keon Coleman, I guess. Does that sound yeah. okay to you? I, I believe I have him ranked right after AD Mitchell right now. Okay, so kind of that next drop, like round 115 or so. Nice. Yep. I think that makes plenty of sense. So you heard it, people. Draft Curtis Samuel, as I've been trying to tell you all off season. Steelers wide receivers. We've already talked a little bit about Arthur Smith and Mike Tomlin, but this one feels like it should have been cut and dry. George Pickens is the undoubted wide receiver one, unless they somehow swing a trade for Brandon Ayuk, which doesn't feel like a particularly Steelers thing for them to do. I think a lot of that chat feels like it's come from Brandon Ayuk's side of the conversation rather than coming from Steelers people. I don't know if you've heard any different. But after George Pickens, Van Jefferson has been tipped by a beat reporter to be the wide receiver two ahead of Roman Wilson and Calvin Austin. But the team, given any kind of indication of who might be ahead in the race to be wide receiver two in an offense that might not be particularly good? They have not. They asked Arthur Smith about it, and he <laughs> rambled for about a minute and a half, <laughs> saying, dude, the, the the things that he said uh, w- during that spiel were wild. Go go go, search it on, on the timeline. Uh, if you can somehow, I, I have the tweet up somewhere. And um, man, he, w- one, one of the things he said was not my responsibility, which is a wild <laughs> thing to say. A wild <laughs> thing to say. And, that, that's, uh, that's the kind of quote you get from somebody working in a fast food restaurant who has been asked to go and, you know, get some rubbish off a table or something like that. That's that's yeah. not the kind of quote we typically associate with NFL coaches. Well, I assume so. You tell me, have you ever got that quote in your index before? <laughs> not that I can remember, but he. it seems like he doesn't know who the wide receiver two is. I I don't think they know. And we might not find out during camp. It might be, it might be late into preseason when we figure out, okay, th- this is this is Pittsburgh wide receiver two, but also there might not be a lot of difference between Pittsburgh wide receiver two, three, and four. You know, like they 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 might kind of mix all those guys through. We know it's George Pickens. We know it's Pat Fryermuth. We know they're going to run the hell out of the ball. You got that quote from Arthur Smith about. 1100 plays 550 are are, are going to be runs okay so the other 550 are going to be passes what's that target share like let's say the running backs combine let's say they combine for 150 which would be a pretty big number so you got 400 targets left all right george pickens what 160 targets maybe yeah right and then you got what does that leave like 140 for the rest of the guys yeah, I mean, I think that's what we're going to end up with. We're going to end up with a lot of guys who get about 60 targets or something and turn in maybe 45 catches. Like, you look at Roman Wilson. He had a really good season in a run heavy of Michigan team. They had 789 yards last year, 12 touchdowns. Definitely exceeded possible expectations there. Then Van Jefferson's only had one season over 380 yards. He's kind of been used more of his deeper threat over the last couple of years with an average depth of target over 16 in his last two. So if Van Jefferson is going to be catching YOLO balls from Russell Wilson or, you know, trying his best to, that's not necessarily something we need for fantasy. For redraft, I think this is very cut and dry, but you look at the running backs, you look at the tight end, you look at George Pickens. And then the rest of these, you know, perhaps Roman Wilson turns into something as the season goes on and finally earns some trust and earns the respect to even be named when being talked about. But I don't think you can draft him in redraft, even in 20 roster formats. In best ball, I don't mind taking shots on these guys, but generally speaking, this is just one to play through the running game. The wide receiver and George Pickens, who, yeah, if he gets 160 targets we know that it's going to be quite boom or bust because he's a big play merchant. But is there anything about how they've used George Pickens previously that you see could be changed this year? Obviously a new offense, but obviously a new role for him with Deontay Johnson gone. Have you heard anything from the coaches, particularly about George Pickens that makes you optimistic for him? No, they, they haven't talked about Pickens, I don't think at all, this, this <laughs> offseason. 
Yeah. I mean, well, all the, I mean, they're not being asked about them. Maybe it's just like yeah. every, every, all the press there is like, okay, George Pickens is, is the wide receiver one. Let's try to figure out who the wide receiver two is here. But do you, do, do you think that's kind of interesting in itself? Because normally when a team trades away a guy who's been a volume hog or a big part of their offense, and they've got somebody coming up behind, you'd expect them to be bigging him up. You'd expect them to say, okay, you know, now he needs to mature. He can be a leader in that wide receiver room or something. But to have nothing feels a little weird to me. They, they usually ask about George Pickens whenever he's done something like off field or, or, or he's been like pouting during a game or, or in a post game press conference. That's, that's when they love asking the, the George Pickens questions. As a as a coach, do you find Mike Tomlin quite reliable? He is uh he's he can be reliable uh some sometimes. I, I do find him an enjoyable watch, but um I mean the the QB stuff they asked him, I think it was a, the end of season press conference last year. Uh, it, it is your QB one on on the roster, and who's that going to be? He said, "Yes, absolutely, they're on the roster." Kenny Pickett will will enter training camp as as the QB one. None of those QBs that were on the roster are around anymore. Completely new quarterback room. Um, yeah, he, he it it depends on like what I mean. Kind of, it depends on what mood Mike Tomlin is in sometimes too. He he is one of the more temperamental guys in the league, and you know, at a post game press conference or or for press conferences, is he's getting questions that he doesn't really care for. Then it's more you know, Kurt, and I'm not giving you anything. Yeah. So he he is kind of in the 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 danger range of like 65 percent is kind of the danger range. For okay. um, for reliability, I, I I view it as like we're playing for our lives here in fantasy football, right? We're playing for money and stuff. So yep. if if someone is two thirds reliable, right? If you if if there's a two thirds chance that something good will happen, but then a one third chance that something bad will happen, right? Or even think about it like a friend. You ask a friend to help you move. And you know that there's a a, a sixty six percent chance that they show up to help you move. Well, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> third chance, <laughs> you're really out of luck. You're in a bad spot there. Um, yeah. So 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 Mike Tomlin can be reliable at times, but he is he he's in the bottom third, I'd say, of of, of coaches whose coach speak is is reliable. He, he's never like maliciously steering you wrong. But also, I don't think he cares that much if yeah. if he's, he gets he's an been around long he enough. Yeah, yeah, he's he just doesn't really need to answer the questions in a way that matters, and he knows that he can do what he want. He knows that he has the team's backing, so that makes mm -hmm. sense. The LA Chargers, Greg, where do we even start here? Because we've got history of Greg Roman being in the league. Jim Harbaugh, last time he was in the league, was a long time ago. When you start trying to gauge how reliable this coaching staff is, do you have anything to go on? Because we have huge question marks over wide receiver. Yes, Lad McConkey is probably the wide receiver one, see the most targets. But outside of that, it becomes very difficult when you look at Quentin Johnson. Of a running back position, we've got two veterans who have dealt with serious knee injuries and Obviously, J.K. Dobbins also had the Achilles injury. Kamani Vidal, who's a sixth rounder. Then you've got Hayden Hurst and Will Disley at tight end. So if this isn't going to be a pass-first offense, but it's going to have Greg Roman hallmarks, then we'd expect the tight end to possibly be useful for fantasy. But it's Hayden Hurst and Will Disley. So have you found any way to kind of build an idea of what stuff that the coaching staff have said will be reliable when they're talking about any of these players. So I, I built Jim Harbaugh's coach speak profile this 
past off season, spent a couple months going back through all, all of his 49ers press conference transcripts. And one thing that really stood out about him is how fluid depth charts are for Jim Harbaugh. It, it, there's no like kind of attachment stuff with him. It's which player is going to give us the best chance to win just flat out. Right. And if you're playing really, really well and you're helping the team, like you're going to keep playing. So for well, starting with, with receiver, they like Lad McConkey a lot. Harbaugh called him a, a Swiss army, uh, Swiss army knife. He's a really terrific route runner which Matt Harmon and Jim Harbaugh have pointed out. They, they like the kid a lot. Quentin Johnston is kind of the X factor here to me. <laughs> yep. Played so terribly last year, but he was also miscast in the role that they asked him to play. And everything that Greg Roman has said this offseason seems like that's not going to be the case this year, that they want to put him in in the best spot for Quentin Johnston, right? Because that's going to end up being the the best thing for the Chargers offense is to use this guy correctly. So we'll probably see a lot of really short stuff, a lot of a lot of screens with him and try to get him uh in 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 space there. And then Joshua Palmer is you know, old reliable Joshua Palmer. <laughs> he's not he's not going to go crazy like he he might not be usable in redraft but probably a pretty decent best ball shot there for the for the running back room yeah get gus edwards obviously the connection with with greg roman like like jk dobbins it, except for gus edwards was able to play a decent amount of the time and jk dobbins has been injured uh it seems like every every season for most of the season and uh <laughs> Gus, Gus Edwards 29 years old not some otherworldly talent you know pretty like that, yeah that, I mean we we definitely saw, right we definitely saw him slow down last year as well I think it was like a lot of the on-off splits that people point to with Zay Flowers they point out okay well Mark Andrews was off the field if you look at the splits for Gus Edwards around the time that Mark Andrews got injured, his efficiency created for the last half of the year. And that was a big part why the Ravens just didn't want to run the ball against the Chiefs, who they should have run the ball against in the AFC Championship because they just weren't getting the play from Gus Edwards. He's only played eight games without Lamar Jackson across his career. And in those eight, his rushing touchdowns per game dropped from 0.42 to 0.12. So I, I really struggle with that. Have, have they been particularly effusive about Kamani Vidal? The general manager, Joe Hortiz, uh, talked about him quite glowingly right after they drafted him. And then Chargers beat reporters have not asked this staff about Kamani Vidal, which inf infuriates me because they have asked Jim Harbaugh at least six questions about his RV <laughs> during this off season and zero questions about Kamani and Vidal. So uh, with this, so going back to the, to, to the Gus Ed Edwards thing real quick, um, this is a terrific offensive line, like really great offensive line. So I think we'll see some high yards before contact for these backs, which might, make Gus Edwards look a little bit better than he is. Uh, I, I, I believe Kamani Vidal is going to end up as the RB one in this backfield. He's just a better back than the, the, than these other backs are. And he's, he graded really, really well in pass protection in college, which is going to be really big for Jim Harbaugh. So they don't have to worry about that. And, uh, yeah, I think I think it's going to be him. Like I said, the the depth charts for Jim Harbaugh are, are very fluid. Whoever the best player is, we saw this in Kent, uh, Kendall Hunter's rookie season. He got a lot of run alongside, I believe, Frank Gore. And you don't always see that with rookie running backs. So it's happened before with Jim Harbaugh. I believe it can it can happen again here. 
All Vidal needs to do is get out on the field, run behind that massive offensive line. I think he was second in missed tackles forced in college football last season. Really high rate of, 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 of forcing missed tackles. Yeah, I think he could really eat behind this offensive line. And then tight end, I think it's just going to end up being Will Disley. Hayden, Hayden Hurst is, is old. He's not good. He, he, I don't think he'll be able to block in the run game like they're going to yeah. want their tight end to block. So, yeah, I think it's just kind of Will Disley by default. Have, have they spoke about the tight ends at all? They, uh, I, I don't think they have. I, I have not caught that. I mean, if the beat reporters aren't asking about a rookie running back who had almost 1,900 all-purpose yards and 15 touchdowns last year, I guess they're probably not asking about who's going to take starter snaps <laughs> between Hayden and Will Disley. Yeah. So, yeah, if you're in doubt and try to work out which charges tight end to take, just don't take either of them. Let it play out. If you miss them on the waiver wire, it's going to be someone else who's quite touchdown reliant out there anyway. A situation that is really one of the most interesting to me is the Patriots quarterback room. I'm very much in the camp that I want to see starting quarterbacks early. I think you look back at the Trey Lance situation. Obviously, he got injured, but not getting out on the field early was so detrimental to his chances to develop. And then we've got Drake May now, who a lot of people seem to think should be sitting for half a season or so. But I am in the camp that he played behind a bad offensive line in North Carolina. He had a pretty bad wide receiver room after Josh Downs left to come to the NFL. So how much worse can it really be for him playing in this situation of the Patriots? How much have you put stock in what's been said by the coaching staff as to how this quarterback room could play out? I'm tracking it very, very closely because it, it has such big repercussions for for fantasy. Jacoby or Jacoby Brissett is is the starter right now. If the season started today, Jacoby Brissett would be the starter. Gerard Mayo has made it very clear that he's going to put out the quarterback that gives them the best chance to win. But then you look at their schedule and how many of these initial 5 games are the Patriots going to end up winning probably probably not a lot what what yeah. they've been saying about drake may is pro is progressing in in a pretty good way i i don't love that they are splitting up reps evenly between brissett may and uh oh my god I who's the, the uh, bailey zappy yeah. yeah yeah so they're splitting them up evenly so they can assess them all right with with the same sample size which i mean you know bailey zappy is not going to be the guy why are you giving him the same number I mean, of practice reps this reminds me of urban meyer making trevor yeah. lawrence uh, the starting job like mm -hmm. you just selected a guy in the top few picks of the draft like you either think he's the guy or you don't i get versus jacoby Brissett, who has had spells over the last few years where particularly with the Browns where it's like when you compared his play with what Deshaun Watson brought when he got to the team, it's like if Jacoby Brissett had started the season the entire way, they probably would have been a playoff team that year. But then last year he wasn't able to become a starter behind some pretty bad quarterback play. So yeah, I mean, for me, I would very much like to see Drake May out there. Do you think that this is legitimately going to be a chance that he, from what the coaches are saying, Drake May has a chance to earn the starter job before the end of camp. It's possible, yeah. Who, if, if they feel like Drake May gives them the best chance to win when the season starts, they're going with Drake May for sure. Uh, they they just want to make sure that they don't throw him out to the wolves before he's ready. Right? This is a this is one of the worst pass blocking offensive lines in the NFL, and. and guys are different in the NFL, obviously, than, than they are in college, you know? And it, yeah. it, it could turn into a real problem. You don't, you don't, you don't want to yeah. put your guy in a really bad position because that could just ruin him. You don't know how they're going to take that until after it's already happened. Yeah, so, I mean, for me, in best ball, I love taking Drake May as my QB3. We're talking about a guy who rushed for almost 1,500 yards and 16 touchdowns over his final two seasons. I think he's got huge upside. In redraft, if you're playing in Superflex, 
he's going to be your ideal QB3. I wouldn't be averse to taking him as my QB2 if I'd kind of punted things later. And then getting somebody else behind him, maybe even a Russell Wilson to start the season to just help you figure out that quarterback position. But in general, it wouldn't be surprising to see him sit for a couple of games because that's just generally how a lot of coaching staff go. Greg, we've rattled through all the things that I had as priority things that we needed to touch on. So there's a few quick hits that I'm going to pick your brain on before we get out of here. The Las Vegas Raiders quarterback situation, how do you see that playing? I think it's going to be Aiden O'Connell, which I believe he's still a dog to start week one on on DraftKings. Antonio Pierce has said that he's going to get the first shot at this, right, as, as the incumbent starter. And Devontae Adams also speaks pretty glowingly about Aiden O'Connell. And he has said that, you know, right now Aiden O'Connell is a starter and that he likes Aiden O'Connell, which I'm sure you and the listeners have, have, have either watched this show receiver on Netflix or seen the clips of Devontae Adams talking about <laughs> Jimmy Garoppolo and how he signed off on on Aiden uh, Aiden O'Connell becoming the the starter, and he's also saying that that there's not going to be a trade that he's going to stay with with the Raiders because there have been some some rumors recently about that. So yeah, I think I, I think plus money on Aiden O'Connell to uh, to be the starter week one is is a good bet. I think Gardner Minshew would really have to separate himself from Aiden O'Connell in order to to win that starting job. Any sort of 50-50 tie is going to go to to AOC. And I just don't think Minshew is good enough to clearly separate himself. I think that's a really interesting point, what you mentioned about Devontae Adams, because Devontae Adams seems to have a huge sway in that oh, team. Yeah. We know that it was pretty much down to the players that they moved on from Josh McDaniels because all the players were just miserable. And it was down to the players that Pierce got the job. So putting those two pieces together and going, okay, well, what is it that the team keeps leaning into? Then, yeah, maybe taking the players for it, unless Gardner Minshew is able to shine in camp makes a lot of sense. Rashad Bateman, look, I'm a Ravens fan. I've tried to keep my Ravens to a minimum on this one. But have you ever seen a player get so much unprompted hype from a coaching staff? ahead of a season and do you think it's worth buying into i think it's worth buying into because it it so much of it has been unprompted when they asked uh, john harbaugh a few months ago about who do you see on your team taking a leap this season he immediately said rashad bateman the ball is going to get to him a lot this year and then todd munkin is, is is saying the same thing like they're 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 all saying the same thing here and I mean, uh, I know some people are really down on Rashad Bateman. Oh, we, we haven't seen it. Well, there there have also been some extenuating circumstances, right? Like it's been tough for him to stay on the field, which if if, if you want to make that like one of your points of, of, of why to not draft Rashad Bateman, I get it. Like he's still going late enough for me where I think it's worth taking him. But you look at the tape from last season, Rashad Bateman was getting open and he was getting yes, open sir. deep. It, he was just not on the same page with Lamar. And some of that could be because he missed basically all of training camp last season with a foot injury. Yeah. He said in a in-house interview with the Ravens podcast, he said that it was only two weeks before the season that he found out he was definitely going to be out of play at all last year. Mm. And by that point, Todd Munkin had obviously had to start crafting the offense more around Odell Beckham instead. So I get it for people who are done with Rashad Bateman. Yes, we're possibly never going to see him turn into the type of quality you expect from a first round wide receiver taking in the top 25 picks. But I think if you're talking about the wide receiver two on an offense that we expect to score a lot of points, then I'm definitely back in. Greg, before we get out of here, What's one more situation that you are most interested to see how it plays out over the next few weeks? Oh my God. It's like asking me to pick a favorite kid. <laughs> um, well, what give me a top... weird question because I don't have any kids. Yeah. Um, <laughs> go, go, give me your top three then if you can narrow it down three. Okay. Top three. Uh, Rico Dowdle is going way too late in drafts. This, this is 
this is a running back by committee. Mike McCarthy has said that. The OC, Brian Schottenheimer, has said that. They're they're very happy with having a, a running back by committee. They asked him about, Zeke, are you expecting the same thing as before? And he said, no, that's not his role. We're running back by committee. So, yeah, bo- both of these guys going late. I think Zeke gets the, the red zone work there, but Dowdle's going to gonna play a lot. The Tampa Bay offense just in general, I'm, I'm high on, and I also think that Bucky Irving is probably not going to be a thing this year. I know some people really love Bucky Irving, but you look, you look at Todd Bowles' history with running backs who weigh under 200 pounds of the most carries they've gotten in, in a season. It's three carries. Oh, and, I didn't know yeah, that one. Yeah, he loves, he, he loves big backs. And also Bucky Irving, 11th percentile in pass protection in, in college last season. Very, very poor in pass protection. That's not going to fly with Todd Bowles, and that's not going to fly with Liam Cohen either coming from the the, the Sean McVay tree. Um, Dontavian Wick season, I, I I guess maybe we'll we'll end on that. Uh, I, I think he takes another leap this year, and I think when you have talent at that level where your coach is comparing you and talking about you like Devontae Adams, how are you not going to play that guy a bunch of snaps? And we're getting we're getting Matt LaFleur saying the sky's the limit with Dontavian Wicks, and now we're getting Jordan Love saying the sky's the limit with with Dontavian Wicks. Yeah, th- this offense could be a nightmare for, for redraft, but the Packers could easily score the most points in the NFL this year, and Dontavian Wicks could be a really, really big part of that. He's just an incredible route runner and really great with the ball in his hands. He's a threat all over the field. So I want to be in on him. I love that. And I think like, if you're talking from a best ball perspective, it's so easy to start with Jaden Reed or Christian Watson, then get Jordan Love. And if you're taking Jordan Love, you want to double stack. You want to double stack with pocket passes because yeah. for them to hit their ceiling, you need them to be passing for 300, 350 yards. And to do that, generally speaking, they're going to spread the ball around. And I think Dontavian Wicks, where he's going... At pick 121 on underdog right now. I would take him ahead of Jacoby Myers with confidence. I would take him ahead of Khalil Shakir, who's going at 107. And I'd possibly even take him ahead of Romeo Dubs for ceiling. I think in redraft, you probably flip that and say Romeo Dubs is fine. And Dontavian Wicks. Dontavian Wicks be the kind of guy that if you're if I'm in a keeper league and I can maybe keep him for a cheap price a year from now. I want to mm-hmm. be taking Dontavian Wicks in like round 15 or something similar to that. Greg, this has been absolutely awesome. I can't thank you enough for kind of bringing so much of this knowledge to the people. You should be following Greg at Coach Speak Index on Twitter. CoachSpeakIndex.com is the website. The same Coach Speak Index on YouTube where Greg is churning out loads of content. I know you've got big plans. Anything in particular that you got for people to be making sure they don't miss over the next couple of weeks? I, w- I would say just follow the the Twitter account. I'm announcing a couple big things in the next couple of days, and I'm releasing the the last of my divisional breakdown podcast that should come out tonight on the NFC East. Yeah, a lot of really great things cooking. Subscribe, stay tuned. You definitely want the notifications on. And uh, yeah, I think this provides a really, really big edge to fantasy football players. So yeah, yeah, just follow along. Uh, it's absolutely must read stuff every day. Whenever I'm scrolling through Twitter and I see any clip with your avatar or your name at the top, I'm always stopping because there is a huge edge to be gained from passing information. And Greg is doing a great job helping all of us. If you haven't already, hit the like button, hit the subscribe, leave us a comment, tell us which of these difficult to pass situations you have a confident opinion on. I want to hear it. We've got loads more redraft and best ball content coming your way. We will be back very soon. 